Welcome everyone to the 18th annual MIT Sloan CIO Symposium, the first digital edition. I'm Alan Tate, executive chair and your host today. This is episode 12, reshaping business strategy for the new abnormal. For questions, uh, please use Q&A at the bottom of your screen and you can also chat amongst yourselves, but we won't be monitoring chat for questions. If you use social media, please use hashtag MITCIO and join the discussion post in the 2021 symposium program under the topic enterprise strategy. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Zoya Kinstler. She is a consultant and educator specializing in enterprise digital transformation. She's also a lecturer in extension at Harvard University and a member of our panel and speaker planning team, as well as a wonderful editor and advisor to me. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zoya Kinsler. Thank you, Alan. Um, it is my turn now to introduce Dr. Yossi Sheffi. I am really honored to have Yossi here on our fireside, virtual fireside chat. And let me say a few words I'm reading. Yossi, your extensive bio, but as you asked, I'm not gonna do the whole uh, two page list of your incredible accomplishments. I'll just say that you are an active working teaching professor, uh, a director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, MIT CTL, that um, under your leadership expanded globally. So you have been instrumental in uh, lifting the discipline of supply chain science and supply chain management around the world. You also teach as a faculty member at um, and professor at uh, civil and environmental engineering department, as well as the Institute for Data Systems and Society. So these are all very current and pertinent topics to our conversation today, but there is more. The books you have written, five or six books now total, and I want to mention just two prior books, one is called the Resilient Enterprise, Overcoming Vulnerability for Competitive Advantage that you uh, wrote in 2005. And then in 2015, you published a book called The Power of Resilience, How the Best Companies Manage the Unexpected. And so, of course, now in 2021, in 2020, you published this book that we will talk about now called the new ab normal reshaping business and supply chain strategy beyond COVID-19. <laughs> Here is the book and may I take a minute to quote from it. It's full of wonderful and witty quotes, but there is just one I couldn't miss because it really pertains to the topic of MIT symposium and CIO symposium in general where we have the audience of business leaders and technology leaders who have been trained and contemplated the topics of risk management and fallback scenario planning and disaster recovery, all discipline and business continuity management, but nobody really took it um, too seriously earlier until what happened uh, last year. So you are saying the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. It provides an opportunity for tough business decisions. The crisis can be used to overcome resistance to change because the crisis itself has disrupted the status quo and created a burning platform that demands 
for organizations to make changes. So welcome, Yossi. Thank you very much, Zoya. <laughs> nice to be with you, and thanks, Alan. Yes, it's it's wonderful to have you here, and let let us uh, talk about the book. So this was a difficult year. Yes, it was a black swan, as Nassim Taleb famously called it, uh, called the the um, phenomenon of black swan being an unexpected and statistically unlikely event, but you call it the darkest of black swans. <laughs> While we all were under lockdown and we were watching the tremendous disruption in both our personal lives and in the global markets and for business leaders in uh, business enterprises, you undertook a tremendous effort to write a diary of it on the one hand, but also to research with your background and with your knowledge, the facts, and to write a very optimistic book. How did this book's idea come to you? Being, of course, an MIT professor of engineering systems and the expert in supply chains who wrote already earlier books on this. Did it feel like you were in the right place in the right time to write this book? Well, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, uh, you know, I've been writing books for, for a while. As you mean, it's my sixth book, was the one you just mentioned. And uh, I started the, the history of writing books about resilience and, and supply chain, and, uh, and specifically supply chain risk management, but risk management, resilience, uh, and business continuity planning in general was actually after 9-11. After 9-11, I was in sabbatical in England, and uh, I was working with some of the big British company, BT, BP, and the BA, and we were all summoned by the, uh, by the home office because they had the, and they, you know, I, I was summoned as an expert in supply chain, and they asked what happened if the next Al-Qaeda attack is on some, uh, not on some symbolic target, but real economic target, like, uh, refinery, port, whatever. And they say, and all these assets are mostly held by the private sector. So everybody looked around the table and nobody had a good answer. So actually I was funded by the British government on my first book because I started working on this. And it, it, but it took about four, four years to, to develop because they do a lot of um, you know, primary research, my own data, I write, to this, talk to anybody who will, who will agree to talk to me created a lot of friends. And, and I wrote the first book, which was The Resilient Enterprise. And it was, you know, sold, you know, very well. Um, about 10 years later, uh, the same companies that I talked to came to me and said, you know, there are more risks, but we are also better. You should write another book. And this was after Japan and after, after Katrina. So um, I, wrote, I wrote the second book. And in between, I wrote a book about I wrote a book about sustainability, about logistic uh, clusters, and, and a lot of other issues. I mean, usually, book take me about four years to write, and I have a system of postdocs and PhD students, and uh, you know, all involved in, in the research. I was in the middle of another book, actually close to the heart of the of the audience here, about how the new technology is going to impact supply chain in the future. Technologies like uh, blockchains and digital twins and then, you know, IoT, uh, whatever. Uh, which one of them will, re will be a big change and which one will turn into a niche product? And then in March 2020, I was kind of midway through this book. The world changed. I mean, I suddenly realized I'm living in the biggest, you know, supply chain event, a business event, of course, but supply chain event in my lifetime. So I dropped the whole, I dropped the team, I, brought the, I dropped the book, stayed with two researchers who helped me, you know, organize the material. And since March through the beginning of August, I was working literally, I was sleeping four hours a night and just working. And this is, you know, very different because it's like writing history while history is unfolding. So I have to write and rewrite and rewrite because things were changing as I was writing them. Uh, just a story. So I submitted the book to several publishers, MIT Press, and several others. 
And they all got very excited. He was an expert on supply chain management with a good track record of best-selling books, a lot of awards. He's writing a book about what's happening in supply chain management. And I said, okay, uh, the book will be ready by mid-August. Um, when can you publish it? And the response said, it takes a year from the time you submit the manuscript and it's published. And, and one of them said, but we have a fast process. It takes only 10 and a half months. So guys, this is a joke. I mean, the book has to be published now. And uh, so I went and did for the first time in my life. I did self-publishing with Amazon. And then I talked to one of the CEO and I said, one of the publishers here, and I said, talking to you is like talking to, you know, um, a travel agent before Expedia. You're gone. You just don't know it yet. Amazon does it in 48 hours and they do a beautiful product. In 48 hours, they publish it and it's available. It's Amazon and Google and Barnes and Noble and, and Apple Store. It's available everywhere within 48 hours. How can you even think about competing? Well, you know, the usual answer, we are there for the long term. It's archival, it's whatever. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's becoming irrelevant. So I, I don't know, but I, uh, I'll have to think, you know, hard about going back to standard publishing because the, the benefit of self-publishing are enormous. Not only you have more control over what's going on, but for example, a month after the publication, we found out a typo in the book. You fix it, and from that point on, all the all the editions are, you know, clean. It, you, you cannot do it with books that that's published, you know, once. You know, you run five thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand uh, run, and it, your books are published on demand. So you work with the demand, exactly tailored to demand, and. So that's the story of uh, of this book. Oh my it came God! Out in, just in time. It came just out in time exactly, just in time. It came out in October one. And by the way, I'm writing another part, which may be added to this book or or different, because I was asked to write. A lot of people wrote to me and asked me to write about the vaccine distribution, which is also a logistics uh, yes. issue. So I'm, I'm writing. We'll see if it's going to be added to this book or a, a little standalone. Yeah. Um, okay. so, so your book story, the book publishing story, is a perfect example of what I actually teach, which is the digital disruption. The digital disruption of business systems and business platforms. It's a perfect illustration of that. And also what it it is a lesson to our CIOs, our audience, our executives, whom we have here as our audience today, is you guys were all in the hot seat last year and you were adopting to this crisis on, on the fly. And Dr. Sheffy in his book gives wonderful, it's, it's a story, it's an adventure story. It's a story of heroic actions of business leaders like yourselves who had to make decisions, be it operations, be it supply chain, be it digital e-commerce, the examples you give as a new balance company switches production lines, their operations from making sneakers to making masks on the fly quickly with branding and materials just right, or the example of replacing the at, at the airline companies how they managed to convert passenger planes that were idle to make them uh, carrier planes for container shipment. These types of stories are really great examples of very fast, just in time thinking. So you had to interview people who were very busy at the time, CIOs, CEOs, uh, board chairmen. You were able to get calls with them and you learn from them how exactly things were happening. So what are the most memorable conversations you had last year? Well, first of all, let me say that the, the reason that I was able to talk to people is because of a track record. People know that I'm not a gotcha journalist. I'm not trying to make people you know, look bad. And, and I'm just telling the story as is. Um, I should tell you right off the bat that a book like this, books like this on risk management resilience that look at data and look at a conversation with people are a little biased, and I'm trying to correct for it, but they're a little biased because people love to tell you the good stories 
And they're not so crazy about sharing their own failures. And in fact, I had many more failure stories in the book, but I, as a matter of course, I always, always submit the manuscript to the people I, I, I talk to. So first of all, for accuracy, and then not to get them into trouble. And one airline executive told me, for example, he, she, the person was head of supply chain at one of my favorite airlines. And the, the person says, we really suck at, you know, at cargo operation. I so I put the quote in the book. And she said, look, I, I, you cannot put it in the book. I mean, I, I'll be, you know, my colleagues will lynch me. So I, of course I take it out. But that, you know, so in, in some sense, the book has a lot of good stories. But let me just say that I argue that uh, a lot of what people read in the media, so breakdown of supply chain, the end of China, supply the end of just in time, are nonsense. First of all, I think that supply chains perform unbelievably well in adjustment. People just don't give credit to people who adjust it. Think about the food supply chain in the United States, in Europe, whatever. From one day to the next, half the, half the destination disappeared. Half the demand disappeared. All the demand in restaurants, in, uh, in universities, in industrial park, gone. Everything went now to supermarkets and, and uh, um, uh, home delivery, which, by the way, it's very hard to adjust because when you sell to, you know, to um, Google to to feed to in, in in the restaurant in the in the complex, you send it in bulk. You don't send little, you know, half a pound bags of something. You send it in fifty kilo bags. Everything. So the machinery to pack it, to send it, is already set. On top of this, people change what they're buying. This, at the beginning, there was a huge reduction in uh, fresh food. There was a large increase in canned food and, and uh, comfort food like pasta and bread. Uh, and yet, if you think about it, we never went hungry. I mean, sometimes, and, and on top of it, there were closure of some plants, and, you know, the headlines were... Literally crazy. I mean, we're running out of food. We're running out of eggs. We're running out of meat. We're running out of this. You know, it could be that for a week, for two weeks, you didn't have your favorite cut of meat. But you had other protein. You had other, other cuts of meat. You didn't have, for a while, you didn't have certain granola favor. Big deal. You had other granola favor. This is not saying, to me, there's a lot of adjustment. You gave the example of New Balance. New Balance had this ad, by the way, Nubana's story is actually inspiring because it's the supply chain people who had a personal relationship with people at MGH and people at MIT. And without going to the design people, they, the good thing is they have plants in, uh, uh, in New England, in Maine. So they were able to, within f- literally four days over a weekend, design, get the material, manufacture, and start distributing online masks. I mean. This is amazing. Uh, you know, just changed, you know, moved on a dime. Lots of companies did this. All the companies, all the auto companies started making ventilators. Flex started making ventilators. Eh. So a lot of the um, media, you know, battle cry that supply chain have not did well. And it's, it's just not true. The adjustment, the, the capability to, to adjust, of private corporation was amazing. By the way, talking to CIO, the the rate at which new technology was adopted during the pandemic was increased substantially. Uh, some of it was because there were a lot of um, hurdles to um, legal and otherwise uh, review were cut short, uh, but people adopted a lot of uh, new technology in the uh, in the process. So there are lots of examples in the book. I don't want to ruin the book for you because I hope you all read it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I loved reading the book and I've learned quite a lot in examples like you're quoting. Uh, but also in my field, in the technology field, I was chuckling reading through finding what I call the enterprise architecture quality attributes, the attributes that we know as how to build systems so that they 
stay flexible and they last and, and they continue evolving, such as end-to-end -end transparency, elasticity, ecosystem, uh, connectivity, agility. You mentioned these terms, applying them to how to keep and make supply chains anti-fragile. For, uh, in your angle, you, you call them strategy attributes. And I'm thinking, yes, that is what strategy is, is having these um, attributes applied throughout, be it business platform or digital platform or together. And so any enterprise IT solution has to have these strategy attributes. Um, so let's talk about the technology frontiers for technology implementations in the supply chain. You, you have just mentioned IoT. Uh, there, is, there is a lot more to talk about. Could you elaborate? Okay, sure. Um, that's a question that uh, I get a lot. I talk to boards, I talk to, and I usually get the complaint from the CIO or from the, usually from the CEO. The board is asking me, what is my, uh, you know, blockchain strategy? <laughs> what is my, uh, you know, they use a technology that's now hype. What's the strategy? And my point is, that's, that's absolutely the wrong question. The question is not what technology is used. The most informed question is, what, te what, what problems are you trying to solve? Right. What is the problem? So... Give a few examples of, uh, of, and usually it's a combination of technology. Uh, there's a company called Resilink that actually the, the CEO is an MIT, the founder is an MIT grad. What they do is the following. There are several um, several services around the world, like Everbright, uh, NC4, and others, who will give you just alarm that something is happening in a certain region. Okay. What Resilink does, they take this operation, they map the entire, or as far as they can go in a supply chain, usually tier one, sometimes tier two of, of suppliers, and well as the company on, on facilities, and create this database of where everybody is. And then if there is something happening in Northern Italy, and they know we have a supplier in Northern Italy, they'll be out for a while. But that's, that's not it. What they do, is they map what's called the bill of material, how every product that the company builds is, is using parts and which parts are coming out of that supplier in Northern Italy. So now they can tell within seconds, once they get the alert, they say, okay, we're not gonna be able to build product ABC and product ABC go to customers one, two, three and customer two is very important. So we have to alert them right away. And by the way, immediately we know the value at risk, what product we are not going to be able to deliver and for how long. So we get value at risk. This is an example of combining lots of, lots of technologies. Another example, uh, transportation visibility. Visibility, by the way, a lot of people who adopted, um, adopted technology during the pandemic were concerned about visibility, trying to understand what's happening at supplier, what's happening in the transportation system. They're still concerned about it. So one example is, uh, think about an automotive plant that where the um, material handler looks every day at the production schedule and at inventory in hand, which look at what they have, what's coming the next 24 hours, the, the, the next 48 hours, invariably, they see that something doesn't match. They, some parts are not coming, but these are in trucks that are already moving towards the plant. This company was able through several technologies, you can go, uh, go over later, get the information of what's on every truck, what's, what part number is on every truck. So now, instead of looking at a single plant, they look at, for example, they work for GM, for Ford, they look at all the plants, so 50, 50 um, assembly plants, uh, engine plants and, and, and transmission plant, the big the big plant, and look at the parts that fly that coming to all these 50 plants, and they look at trucks that are on the move, and then they run a big optimization and try to 
reroute the truck. So some trucks have to stop first at this plant and, and, and offload something. Other trucks have to go to some relay point, offload something, and another truck will pick it up and, and, and go to another plant. And because of this, they save what's called expedited freight. Because otherwise, the plant manager will pick up the phone and get a helicopter or a, or a dedicated truck to run to the supplier and get the part. And they were able to minimize a lot, a, a lot of this. Again, using a lot of uh, machine learning and AI and, and uh, you know, uh, geofencing and, and other big, uh, big optimization. So it's, it's a combination of it. Finally, let me just, uh, one last example is a company called Flex, F-L-E-X-E, not, not F-L-E-X, just F-L-E-X-E. So you know that uh, this company is, is the, you might call it Airbnb or cloud of warehousing. Let's think about Airbnb of warehousing. So you know when you have a warehouse, let's say you are a company, just a startup, you have a warehouse, you are not using. You're using a few percentage of it until until you build up the business, and then you have more more and more warehouse to increase your uh, your level of service. So warehouses are always either you don't have enough or you don't, uh, or you have too much. This company has an agreement with over a thousand warehouse and distribution center and fulfillment center in the United States, and they put their own operate warehouse operating system in this. In its facility side by side with the with the existing system. Now, any company that needs space can call them, and within a week, they'll get them in a warehouse and they can start operating from there. Interestingly, companies like Walmart are both a customer and a supplier. Many of the companies are both a customer and a supplier because sometimes a retailer will have you know extra space, so they'll lend it out or Airbnb it out. And sometimes they don't have enough and they, need, uh, and they need other space. But what they did, they actually changed the, uh, the cost structure to be variable cost rather than, rather than fixed cost. And this is some of the essence of, uh, of building in flexibility, as much, moving as much as you can to variable cost rather than a lot of fixed cost. By the way, uh, the movement to the cloud has elements of this. If you talk about uh, you know information technology, but the solution you know in supply chain is not only technology; it's always process and people and technology. Right. I have to get the whole thing together. And, and and thank you for bringing it up. I just want to comment on on the blockchain question that I couldn't agree with you more. That blockchain <laughs> first get the problem and posting. <laughs> problem statement correctly is 90% of the solution, as we all know. And good examples in supply chain, as you know, and, and the audience probably heard of is Tradelands, a consortium for, uh, where Merck and others are founders using IBM Hyperledger for doing the shipper, shipper carrier um, um, uh, collaboration ecosystem. But that is still looking for a problem, looking for incentives, looking for the pricing model. And the same is Mediledger for pharma business for having a transparency in the provenance of medical drugs and medical supplies. Same problem, uh, the technology is there, the business model exists, but to incentivize, to price correctly, to um, get the buy-in is, extremely hard. Um, so let us let us go back to your point about uh, business justification and the pricing and the outcome-based modeling of, in, in te technology implementations. Because when I listen to your examples as an architect, I think, okay, I need the edge server, I need 5G here, I need sensor capability, I need an IoT adapter in uh, AWS cloud, so I can architect the thing, but to bring people to use it, and as you're saying, to establish the process is a huge business overhaul, business process overhaul. And yes, it's user enablement, and yes, it's motivation, but mostly it's the model of pricing and outcome measuring 
And so we do have technologies, the IoT, the cloud, the tech platforms for new ways of executing transactions, for integrating, for data analytics, but it is costly. So how should we justify paying for building um, the, the attributes, the strategy attributes of resilience, flexibility, agility, and such? Sure, uh, excellent question. Because I'm always asked when, you know, when I talk about resilience, okay, building it takes effort. It's a it's big change management. It's sometimes extra suppliers, sometimes ex, extra assets. It all costs money. How do you justify it? So, first of all, I should say that uh, this is, I always impart on, on my listener that this is actually a board function. The board has to worry about the, the long term because these are investments that you hope you'll never use. So it, it, it's long, it, it's especially an investment dedicated to responding to, uh, to, to whatever crisis. The way you should think about it is compare it to insurance. You know, insurance is also investment. It's for sure you pay now and maybe or maybe not, and you hope not, you're not gonna get the reward in the future. So why is it that I argue that uh, it's much better to build resilience than to invest in insurance? You need some insurance, but not too much because in insurance offer only financial indemnification. Resilience help avoid the loss of trust or reputation if a company failed to fulfill its commitment to its customers. Insurance also covers only a few named hazards. But resilience can also cover unknown, uncertain, act of God events, some, you know, the darkest of black swans, so, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's basically an uh, adversarial process. After the 2010 uh, Iceland volcano, whatever the name is that nobody can pronounce, insurance company denied business interruption claims, even for airlines and airports, because the volcano caused no physical damage that would create the basis for the claim. They just couldn't fly. Okay, it's not, not, it's not, uh, not our problem, so to speak. So it's, a, it's a basically an adversarial transfer of risk uh, that faces some uncertain payoff, while resilience is an internal capability that's allied, allied with the business. Uh, one point, you know, in its annual report, uh, in 2015, when I look at it, Intel noted that one of the risk factors is that one of more of their insurance provider may be unable or unwilling to pay a claim. Um, so it's a problem. Finally, resilience can bring a competitive advantage because what's the problem with uh, um, supply chain disruption? The problem is that there's, just like now, you don't have enough supply for the existing demand. But resilience, building in the flexibility and all the uh, agility can help you respond to good events if demand goes up. And I was working with uh, Starbucks uh, years ago when they started making sandwiches. So they had a, you know, their, their forecast of how many sandwiches will be, will be demanded in the first six months. They had the, you know, one standard deviation low, one standard deviation high, the way I always argue. You know, people should do it. Turns out it was five times higher than the highest range. I mean, they have no, but they actually an agile company was able to deal with it. The supply chain function was able to deal with it. So that's an example of, um, you know, a good thing that, uh, uh, that can happen, the resilience, building in this, everything that we are talking about. But as I said, I, would, I want to, to press that it's not stress, that it's not only technology. It's technology, people, processes. Sometimes it changing culture. Sometimes be, people be paranoid. You know, expect things. Part of part of the you know solution. This is so relevant. Thank you, Yossi, for for uh, stressing out the need for the comprehensive approach to. Um, justifying um, the investment in uh, resilience. 
with your examples of insurance and this Starbucks supply chain for sandwich is great. I have another example that I'm sure that our audience um, is um, grappling with right now. And that is how to justify a large investment needed in cybersecurity. Because now wow. we see the impact, we see the tremendous impact. But if you apply the usual um, frameworks for business justification, how do you justify an event of security breach that is very high impact and very low probability, used to be at least rather low. Right. The probability, probability is going up. <laughs> right, but the probability is going up, the cost is going up, but to invest in it significantly, not only in technology, but in culture, in retraining, in hiring, in building platforms, subscribing to various hacker lists and, and uh, buying very extensive uh, uh, platforms such as SOAR and SEAM and, and SAS and whatever is now available is a tremendous investment. So yes, your point about uh, the, the need to look at it comprehensively as a resilience project is incredibly uh, pertinent. Because at the same time, you know, people bring their devices to the company, they tie to the company net, or they respond to a phishing email and uh, let yeah. strangers get into, get into the system. Right. And so and it, it, a lot of people are, have to be involved in this. It's and even if you have a TV in the conference room, everything now has its own little server. Everything yeah. has its own IP address. And so any technology that employees bring in or even buy with corporate money is suspect. So to establish not just the culture, but the discipline and the monitoring and the policy is uh, incredibly important in today's world. Um, let us open up the um, question and answer session. What do you think, Yossi? Are we ready for questions from the audience? Yeah, I, see some, I, see some, I see some question here from Ali Karimi. Yes. The question is, uh, have you looked into the healthcare delivery? What were the issues discovered and, they, and how they mitigated the issues? Okay. We had, I always, I said in, a, in my book and in my you know, talks that supply chain actually performed miraculously well with one exception. PPEs, gowns, and uh, these were, it, actually these were not company issues, these were government issues. Because in the United States, uh, Bill Clinton, when he was president, built a tremendous inventory, strategic inventory of all these uh, items. Uh, the Bush administration built it up even higher. They had, of course, 9-11 to contend with, but they built it up tremendously. Then the Obama administration whittled it to nothing, and the Trump administration probably didn't even know it existed. But it, you know, it didn't do anything with it. So we, we came with bare bones um, you know, inventory. So let me talk about these specific things and how to fix it. Uh, I mentioned in my book, but what the hell. Uh, <laughs> there are three-pronged solutions for this. Number one, start again a strategic inventory. This strategic inventory can be, the good thing is the United States has only five large distributors of, of medical supplies. They can be the one responsible for it. And the idea is to keep it a live inventory, so don't let things get stale. Simply, they cannot use this inventory. This, uh, so, so what happened is a hospital will call and, or not call, dial and want some, some uh, item, it will be out of stock. It's not really out of stock, but they get to a red line that the government set, and only the government can release it from this red line. So you always have inventory. It's first come, first serve, so it's, uh, um, it's always live. This has to cover about three months worth of stuff, maybe something like this. Another type of inventory. So, so this is actually a model after the strategic petroleum reserves. That's how they're managed. Only the, only the president... Uh, uh, can release them beyond, beyond a certain level. So companies can put stuff in and out, but it has to be, you know, the government set up the level that it has to be kept in, but only the president can. So this avoids um, all the problems of too much stock that actually ruins quality and, and, and level of service and a lot of other things. 
Uh, the second thing is you should think, again, building the example of what happened after the financial crisis, that the uh, bank had to go to stress test, you have to apply stress test to hospitals. Every hospital, let's say, have three weeks, a month worth of this inventory and cannot go down, and they have to be audited. And as part of their you know, uh, um, license to operate, they have to keep certain, uh, certain inventory. As I said, uh, this is just like uh, the banks after the financial crisis. Same thing, but not, not with money, but with certain supplies. The last item is that we need also people. And uh, for dealing with a pandemic of this size. So building, actually modeling after the, uh, mili- the, the Army National Reserve, we need to create a medical National Reserve of people who will be able to come to work once a month for a weekend and every summer, maybe two months train in the hospital. These people are not gonna do brain surgery, but they're gonna release other people to do more complicated stuff. And by the way, operating a ventilator, you can learn within a few hours. It's not complicated because it's all, you know, it tells you what you have to do on the screen. Uh, But of course you need uh, need more than that. that's an example of dealing with a, with a healthcare system. It's one flying the ointment actually did not work well didn't, uh, yeah. during the pandemic. You see, why don't you look at the questions and choose? Yes. I'm a facilitator, but I would hate choosing questions for you when you can do it yourself that you feel are more uh, enlightening and uh, uh, make it interesting for okay. us to hear. Roy Goldschmidt, right. Uh, first of all, he said, great discussion, insightful. I'm sucker for flattery, so that's good. Um, will we see, that's a good question. Will we see warehousing and supply chain, a similar consolidation like we see for cloud computing with the future only a few high-tech companies providing the services or a big part of producer and retailer? Interesting. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. The reason is there, I, there is some consolidation in the people who, um, there are some large companies who build warehouses and actually build a, a whole complexes of, of, of warehouse, and warehouse hubs and uh, you know, warehouse clusters. But those are rented to multiple companies. Companies want, want their own. So as long as we don't see a big consolidation in the logistics providers business. Many of them own this warehouse, but also companies own them. It's companies want, want to have a say and, and, and want to own, uh, to own the warehouse. When I say own, they may lease it, maybe a, you know, a long-term lease, but uh, so far most companies want to own it. So the only que- as I said, the only question is, will there be a big, uh, you know, consolidation in the in the provision of logistic services, it's it's not seen yet. There are some bigger animals, but some of them are breaking up, like all you know. Yeah. So, not clear that uh, that it's a big danger right now. Uh, actually, I am uh, siding with the person who asked the question, Yossi. So here is uh, something to think about for the future, Uh, an official NIST standard definition of cloud, the cloud attributes are um, elasticity uh, and multi-tenancy. And then there's a bunch of others, right? Pricing, uh, different pricing models. So that would apply to uh, the strategy attributes you describe as flexibility, agility, and warehousing, and all. So elasticity and multi-tenancy already, multi-tenancy exists, but elasticity not yet, because you're saying they're logistically not ready. But uh, it will be fun to watch. We watched it uh, 15 years ago with skepticism toward cloud uh, hosting. No, I mean, I actually, I I must admit that until you know Amazon came out with its first you know financial, 
I didn't seriously look at the cloud. <laughs> I mean, then, and wow, they were making more, they were losing money on, on the retail and making money on the cloud. And yeah. I started really looking at it, at, yeah. at what they're doing. Also, my son works for Google, so he works at the Google Cloud. <laughs> right. <laughs> and if you remember, there was this um, infamous video that is still on from 2004 or six with uh, CEO of Oracle, Larry Allison, saying, what cloud? What do you mean cloud? What's the big deal? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Zoya, the problem is that, uh, you know, software as a service was around before we talked about cloud. Oh, yeah. And for a while, people kind of did not did not understand that the cloud is a step up from right and it's a business service. model change and that is what uh, broke the camel's back the straw that broke the camel's back it's the uh, the business model the pricing per seat and per utilization technology existed but the new way of using servers a virtualization existed forever, right? So that is the beauty of the business. As to your point, it's a business model, it's the pricing and the process that makes a difference in any transformation solutions. Yeah. We are getting... Uh, somebody, uh, you know, my friend Irving Walaski will argue with me about, uh, <laughs> about blockchain. Um I don't want to argue with Irving about uh, about blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> He's a believer. I'm not, so it's a. <laughs> um, I, but he has another question: uh, Could we view regulation require a company to pass cybersecurity inspection ak akin to similar regulation in civil engineering, the financial sector? I, that's a very interesting thought. That um, because. Uh, we saw what happened with the you know, colonial pipeline. And let me also start by saying that when I do my standard presentation, people ask me, what's next? What, what's the next uh, you know, big disruption? Should we prepare for the next pandemic? And my answer is not, yeah, of course, you should prepare for everything, but you can't prepare for everything. So why you should build general resilience and think out of the box? And my answer, my my example is always cybersecurity because think what happened in the pandemic. We all went online. We all went to, you know, um, stuff delivered from Amazon and, and, and Zoom and all of this. What will happen if a major cyber attack? It will be exactly the opposite. There'll be no online. We'll have to meet face to face. We'll have to go to the store to buy stuff. The whole supply chain will have to work, you know, entirely differently. So, have to think about it seriously, but as as Erwin and everybody here knows, the the issue is that uh, the digital infrastructure is serving the physical infrastructure, and we can lose you know the grid and you know water and a lot of other services that are running on the uh, digitally. And of course, now that we can have autonomous cars and uh, you know traffic light on, you can only manage the mayhem that one can, you know, uh, put into the system. So the answer is from the government side, and I am part of uh, the Parliament of Homeland Security um, task force that look at some of these issues, and the government is thinking about offensive capabilities as well not only defensive capability, like a mutually assured, assured destruction. But as, this doesn't help companies. Companies need, need to do it. And I think that the, what Erwin is talking about, the idea of regulation is the excellent idea because, because you have to level the playing field. And because a company goes down, you never know when, you know, how to get out of it, how, how, it uh, how bad it can be, how it can influence, how it can be some cascading effects. So, man, government regulation is a, is a good, I don't know if the administration is looking at it, but giving the, if any administration will be looking at this, is this one, which seems to like regulation, unlike the previous administration. So maybe, maybe we'll get, but I think this is something that's, Certainly worth serious discussion. Um, 
Yes, I want to comment on, on uh, your point about how um, with the technology of IoT especially and everything, now having a digital infrastructure on top of physical infrastructure, how there is a lot more vulnerability to the physical side. Uh, it was GE originally when they built the Predix platform for their IoT management. They talked about that every physical object in the machinery in the manufacturing plants or, or turbines or aircraft engines will now have a digital twin, which is the uh, uh, digital model, the, the, um, the mathematical and technical model of the physical object. But now the new term that I like they introduced was a digital ghost that in addition to having a mathematical model of the object or a CAD model plus math and stats to, for the object, you need to have a security model on top, how to watch this and monitor this for security. And so every digital twin better have a digital ghost on top. And that is of course, um, something that would need standards and, 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 and regulations and ways to report and ways to collect data. So yes, today we don't have it. I want to respond to another question that was asked by uh, Jose Luis Lopez. Um, he mentioned that uh, talking about better way to supply chain, chain resilience and uh, uh, what happens when information becomes obsolete and future demand is, uh, is unclear. So I want to maybe specifically to this audience because they can be influential here, is that uh, people may be in some sense automating too much and too quickly, whether it's, uh, you know, all kind of robotic process automation, all kind of. The problem with this is that in many cases, we lose the ability, we lose the, the, the sense for a system. If you're talking about supply chain, it involves relationship with suppliers, it involves different, you know, global supply chain and go around the world with different culture, different legal regime. And uh, you lose the, the, the edge when something big happens because, if you think, try to explain to my student who are all gaga about machine learning, that machine learning would not have solved prediction problem during the pandemic. Because if something structural changes that you didn't train, whether it, and it doesn't matter if it's linear regression or, or, or ML-based uh, algorithm, because you didn't train them, the, if the training data is totally unlike the future data, it's not working. And we saw, several supermarkets that I was talking to, going to manual ordering because the automatic ordering system that was based on a algorithmic forecast was completely unrealistic. The people were ordering different amounts, different stuff, completely different. So what I mean is that it, the trick when you install all the system is to make sure, and it may even, thought, may even be thought about as another redundancy, the trick is not to lose the ability of some people to understand the system and to be able to intervene and to be able to say, gosh, this makes no sense. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because the algorithm still didn't capture this, that, and the, and the other thing. And of course, if things are stable and small interruption, that's fine. But when something substantial happens, when there's structural change in the system, they have to have people who don't lose the, uh, their understanding and their uh, ability to intervene in the system and understand what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Uh, looking at the law, okay, lots of stuff. Yeah. Um talking about how people still have the ability, should have the ability to understand the structural change and understand the architecture, understand the impacts. That brings back the thought of still needing to document the architecture decisions, to document the uh, transformation strategies, to document everything so that um, any sophisticated algorithm um, 
cannot just be a black box. It has to have the in and out as any complex system. You want to be able to decipher the logic and, and the functionality and be able to intervene. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at other questions. Uh, Kevin Milliken is still ta talking about labor in supply chain. They talked about the uh, warehouse cluster often strategically located geographically for network purposes. And that they, they create, um, they may create a shortage of labor and limited human resource supply. Yes and no. I actually wrote a book about it, logistic clusters. Turn out that when you start it, it sometimes happened, but by and large, very quickly, the, in the United States, I should say, it, it, it takes a lot longer in Europe. System adjust. For example, in the Dallas Fort Worth area, there are now five, univers five colleges, universities, who are offering degrees in a, a, a two year degree, a two year associate degree in being a forklift driver, in being, you know, all the, all the, uh, the uh, jobs in a warehouse. Uh, and so you have the system adjusting. And so it's, I, I'm not sure. And furthermore, one of the good things about the logistic cluster, unlike other industrial cluster, by the way, logistic cluster, the good thing, they serve many, many industries, not one industry. So there are, you know, there's a warehouse of toy manufacture, a warehouse for, you know, automotive parts, a warehouse for, you know, aeronautics parts, whatever. So they go on to different business cycles. Some go up, some go down. So a contraire, the nice thing about having a logistic cluster is that the uh, labor can move from operation to operation because if you know how to um, operate a forklift for moving pallets of toys around, you can move pallets of, any, of anything around. And in many of these uh, clusters, there are actually formal ways of companies to share labor. So it's actually, it works for the best in this particular, uh, this particular case. So, um, it turns out it's the, the, the agglomeration of logistics activity specifically is usually not a problem. It actually creates a lot of efficiency. Uh, when you have an agglomeration, different type of agglomeration, when you have, a, you know, in Taiwan, agglomeration of uh, chip manufacturing, well, that's, that can be a problem because if you think the chip, we don't have enough chips today, think about what happened if China really start going on Taiwan. I mean, that's Taiwan semiconductor will, will be out of business and that they make the best, they are the biggest and the, and the best in the world in what they do. So we're gonna have even less, even less, we're gonna have no chips. So uh, this, is, this is a type of, um, of cluster that, is, that has some um, fragility in it, actually. Yeah. So, uh, Yossi, we have time for one more question. And if I may propose, going back to Please. Roberto Torres, who asked the very first question, I asked him to be more specific. And his specific question is about leadership traits that will be most critical following the lessons of the pandemic. Would you like to comment? Yes, it's a... Uh... First of all, being cool under fire, of course, whether it, in, you know, internally or cool or not, it doesn't matter. Being cool under fire, a obsessively communicate, even if, be able to communicate even if you don't have all the, all the answers. It's absolutely okay to say, I don't know what's going on with this, that, and the other thing. We are working on this. This team is working. I hope to have answers in two weeks or... What am I doing to get the answer for things that I don't know the answers for? The worst thing is not to communicate because then people start imagining the worst and people usually don't imagine the best, they imagine the worst. So communicate obsessively. Allow people at the close to the action to make decisions. Don't, uh, don't overmanage. In many of these crisis situations, there's no time to go up the chain of command to get all the approvals and to go down. 
And in, this, in, in cases of uh, a crisis, you have to let the teams on the ground make decisions. And the culture that you build have to be able to not punish them if they make the wrong decision. Because that sure enough will go like wildfire through the organization and nobody will take responsibility and make decisions. So one of the leadership traits is to encourage people um, people we, you know, will make decisions. I see that Kevin writes something, in the absence of information, the most negative uh, you know, idea will fill the void. <laughs> exactly. So uh, communicate or obsess. You'll be talking about letting the people on the ground, I have many examples in, in, in this book and in previous book about allowing the teams on the ground to make, uh, to make decisions and then get out of their way. I mean, don't feel that you have to approve or make decisions. In many cases, your people know better than you. I mean, because they're close to the action. They know the details. They wrote the system. They, you know, they know how to, uh, they, they know the suppliers. They know the capabilities. They know the system. Uh, I did a lot of it in the, uh, in the book, The Power of Resilience, I think, when I wrote about, I was, you know, I wrote about the GM emergency management uh, operation during, during Japan. And they had logistics people, engineering people. And then there are several examples. The vice president came and said, do this. You know, you, get, you don't get to be a vice president in GM if you are a wallflower, if you don't make decisions, if you don't appear tough and decisive. And this was always the wrong decisions. Because if you, are, you said, do this, and you don't realize that in a system as complex as automobile, Everything is connected to everything else. So you just screw things up. And it happens several times. Uh, so GM, in their after-action report, called it, we have to make sure that people, everybody, swim your lane. Don't jump to other things. Don't do things that are not in your wheelhouse because you understand this part, and so just deal with it. Anyway, this is some of the ideas. This is great. Uh, we all need to hear it. Thank you, Yossi. Words of wisdom. Thank you. There are many more questions, but we promised this was our last one. So back to Alan. Well, thank you, Zoya and Yossi. I also enjoyed the book, and this discussion really brought it to life. Uh, to the audience, I say let's continue the conversation. Join the all-member chat event that is live right now. Um, also, you can post your thoughts to the 2021 symposium program under the topic Enterprise Strategy. Also, tomorrow at 10.30 a.m., I'll be joined by Lindsay Anderson for our final open discussion of the season. On the agenda will be enterprise strategy, as well as the two panels that we had this week. Until then, you can join us today at 4 p.m. The International Partners Booth will be having what we're calling an early dinner party. These events are designed for small groups to get to know each other. Chitra Dwarka will host Carly Chase of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, and they'll be talking about how to apply startup tactics and best practices in large organizations. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Replays will be posted in the 2021 Symposium Program Agenda. That's all we have for today. Bye for now.